Jesus Christ led a sinless life. It was crucial that he do so. And all of us, well, you know, when we think about the challenge that would be ahead of us in living a sinless life, must at times feel a little bit defeated. But what would it like, what would it be like, what would it mean to you to be able to live a sinless life? I got to thinking about this and I thought, put together a relatively short list. If I'd taken more time, I probably could have found more. But I found 11 benefits that would come your way from leading a sinless life. Number one, you would be a happy person. A happy person. Because as you read through the Bible, you see all these things, for example, in the Beatitudes, in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed is the man, blessed is the man. The word is makarios in the Greek, and basically it means happy. And the Old Testament word for blessed also means happy. And so happy is the man. In Psalm 119, verses 1 and 2, it says this. Happy are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are they who keep his testimonies and that seek him with their whole heart. We wrote it into one of the founding documents of our, our country that we believe that we're entitled to the pursuit of happiness. Well, one of the aspects of living the sinless life would mean that you would be a happy person. Number two, it would mean that you would live through your life with a clear conscience. You'd never have to be ashamed. There'd never be one of those nights when you lie awake into the wee small hours of the morning berating yourself about something you've done. Having your cheeks burn with shame every time you recall the mistakes and the stupid things that you have done. It would be the realization that even when you're in trouble and even when you're locked away in jail, it's not because you were wrong or you did something to be ashamed of. It might very well be because you were honoring God. That the sufferings that come your way in your life are not something you have to be ashamed of. That the sufferings you bear in your life are something you can wear like a badge. In that same 119th Psalm in verse 5 it says this, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I will not be ashamed when I have respect to all your commandments. Three, you would live your life above reproach. You wouldn't have to sit still for having people reproach you for the stupid things you have done, to berate you about the things you have done, because you would know that the reproach would slide off of you because you were not guilty, you had behaved according to God's law. You had behaved according to the inspiration of the Spirit of God. You had followed God's way. And the reproaches that were falling upon you were undeserved. I'll tell you the difference in the confidence level of when you are being reproached and when you are being mistreated, when you know you have done the right thing, has got to be something pretty profound. You notice I said, has got to be? Because I myself have not really quite had that experience to be able to tell you what it feels like. But the 119th Psalm, the psalmist said this, My soul breaks, this is verse 20, for the longing it has to your judgments at all times. You have rebuked the proud that are cursed who err from your commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Number four, it means freedom, liberty from oppression. Oh, I don't mean that they may not lock you up in jail. But I have to think of the Apostle Paul and those men who were clapped in jail in Philippi, their feet in stocks, and sitting in there in the middle of the night, midnight rolls around. What are they doing? They're singing songs and praising God because they had been accounted worthy to suffer for Christ's name's sake. They had been in the right place, doing the right thing, had been arrested and slammed in jail unjustly for what they had done. They may have been in jail, but in their hearts, they had a liberty that we might envy. In the 119th Psalm, verse 41, Let your mercies come to me, O Lord, even your salvation, according to your word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproaches me, because I trust in your word. And don't take the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your judgments. So shall I keep your law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, because I seek your precepts. I will speak of your testimony before kings, and I'll never be ashamed. This sinless life, the leading of the clean, moral, sinless, upright life, has benefits we could not even imagine. Number five, 
It means your companions will be God-fearing people. Because the people who don't care about God, the people who have no respect for God, will tend to shy away from you. Your conduct, your life will be a reproach to them, even though you say nothing. They will tend to shy away from you, and the companions that around you will be people who fear God. Here's what the psalmist said in verse 62. At midnight I will rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments. Got out of bed in the middle of the night to thank God because of what he knew about the righteous judgments of God. I am a companion of all them that fear you and of them that keep your precepts. They are my brothers. Those people are. The earth, O oh Lord, is full of your mercy. Teach me your statutes. Number six, it will mean you are a person with uncommon judgment and a sense of justice. Uncommon judgment. Psalm 119.65, you have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. And by the way, thy word or your word throughout the 119th Psalm is another synonym because there are about seven or so synonyms in here for the law of God. And this is one of them. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed your commandments. Now that's really something to consider. Good judgment and wisdom. Number seven. It would mean that you are a person of uncommon wisdom and understanding. Psalm 119, 97. Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, have made me wiser than my enemies, for they are always with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. You know, living the sinless life has benefits. It has some very real benefits that come your way as a result of doing so. Number eight, you can have great peace of mind and heart. Psalm 119, 164, seven times a day do I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Great peace have all they who love your law and nothing shall offend them. Great peace have all they that love your law and nothing shall shall offend them. Which means, I guess, number, you know, number nine, you will not have to ever be offended to get your feelings hurt, not if you walk according to this. Number ten, it would mean you never hurt anyone. That you will never hurt anyone. And you'll never, therefore, have to apologize. Now, that doesn't mean that you will never get hurt. Because evil men seem to take special delight in afflicting the innocent and the good and the upright. But it does mean you will not cause hurt. And number 11, kind of my summary, it biases life in your favor. It puts a thumb on the scales of life and biases everything that takes place in your life in your favor. Now, with all this going for it, with all these benefits, why, who would not want to live a sinless life? Why would we not want to do so? Then why don't we? Why don't we? If a person with all these benefits, with all this stuff, and you know, I went through the 119th Psalm and found a lot of these, and I think if we sat around the table and talked for a while, we could probably put together a list twice this length and maybe more of the benefits of living the sinless life. So why don't we? I know. The answer comes back. It's impossible to live, live the sinless life. Nobody can ever keep the law of God perfectly. We can't, there's no way that we can somehow live this way. After all, there's Paul in Romans 3, verse 9. What then? He says. Are we better than they? Oh no, in no wise, because we have already proved in the verses past, both Jew and Gentile, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one that understands. There is no one that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become profitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Now, when you read that in context, you'll realize that this is a very cynical view of life, and it isn't necessarily to be taken as an accurate view of life in that sense. But what Paul is citing is an Old Testament, the Old Testament psalm that basically this is the way David looked at everything at one point in time. But I read this, and I thought about this, 
And I've thought about how it is that most of us would assume and believe that it's impossible to live a sinless life because everybody's going to commit sin. And in my simplicity, I ask, why would God give us a law we cannot hope to keep and then punish us for not keeping it? Now, this is a question I, you know, I, that I remember asking myself many, many years before I ever came to this church uh, because the question kept coming up in my mind. You can't keep the law. And I'd hear a preacher from the pulpit say it's impossible to keep the law of God perfectly. And I would say, okay, fine. Now here we see that the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. But the wages of sin is death. Why are we guilty for not doing something that we can't do? It made no sense to me. And their self felt all along that there was something decidedly wrong with the picture. And then you have people mentioned in the Bible from time to time like the mother and father of John the Baptist. Remember their names? Their names are Zacharias and Elizabeth. And Luke tells us this little interesting thing about Zacharias and Elizabeth. You'll find it in the first chapter of Luke. It's just a short section. There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias. He was of the course of Abijah. His wife was one of the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. And listen to what the Bible says about these people. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Now, what happens to our idea that it's impossible to live the sinless life? When you have these two very fine people, it says, they walked in all the commandments of the Lord, blameless. And when you think about it, which of the laws of God, taken in isolation, is impossible to keep. Which one of them in, in, in particular is it impossible to keep? Is it just impossible for us to not lie? Is it impossible for us to leave somebody else's property in, pl in place and not steal from them? Is it impossible for us to, to neglect and fail to honor our, our father and our mother? Or is the honoring of our father and our mother well within our grasp? The truth is, you work your way down through the Ten Commandments. Every one of them is well within your grasp. You can do them all in any given situation that you face, on any given circumstance. It is within your grasp. For if it were not, how could you be blamed for not doing what you could not do? I don't think God would give me a command I couldn't keep and then smack me for not keeping it. To me, that has never made any sense. The law of God is not impossible in its particulars. It is not impossible for you to tell the truth. It is within your grasp, as I said earlier, to honor your father and your mother. And then, here's what Paul wrote to the Philippians. This is another short one. You needn't bother turning to it. It's in the second chapter, verse 14. Do all things, Paul said, without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Paul writes to the Philippians and he says, I want you to do all this without murmurings and disputing so that you may be blameless and harmless. Now those are two really wonderful characteristics. You'd love to have somebody say of you that he's, he's harmless. He wouldn't hurt anybody. He never has. A kind person, a gentle person, a good person. These are, this is a reputation most of us, I think, would like to have. And then Paul said of himself, later in Philippians, in chapter 3, verse 4, this, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks he has whereof he may trust in the flesh, well, I've got more. Circumcised the eighth day, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now here's the great apostle Paul, who comes along and tells us, I, as judging the righteousness of the law, am blameless. Here's the problem. We know Paul was not blameless by his own admission, don't we? Because he wrote to Timothy, his own son in the faith, one of the letters he said to him, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul didn't consider himself just your ordinary garden variety sinner. He considered himself a very serious big time sinner. And yet earlier he says in the same book, he says that he actually lived blameless 
uh, not in the same book, but a different in the letter to the Philippians, that he lived his life concerning the law blameless. Now, this is all very confusing, frankly, when people who try to grasp this, and I've had these questions asked to me many times down through the years about this whole idea of God giving us a law that's impossible to keep, and whether or not, if it really is impossible, how could these people be blameless? Now, the question is, what can we understand? First of all, let's see if Jesus can shed some light on it. And this time you may want to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and verse 17. The scripture is very familiar, I think, to all of us. We've read it many times. Jesus said, don't think I am come to destroy the law. I have not come to destroy. I have come to fulfill. And that word is a lot more important than I think many people do. It's been taken wrong, I think, as an excuse for not keeping the law of God. But it is a, it is a word that can, conveys an enormous amount of meaning when you understand what he's talking about. The Greek word here that is translated fulfill basically means to fill something up. The same word, and keep your finger here because we're going to come back to Matthew 5, but the same word is used in Matthew 13 and verse 47 on an incident, just a, uh, another, another th something totally unrelated. Jesus is giving kingdom parables. And he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, and that's the word, same word, plerao, which basically means to fill something and make it full. When it was full, they drew it to shore and sat down and gathered the good in the vessels, cast the bad away. Same word. And it means to fill something up. Okay, Jesus then says, I am not come to destroy the law. I have come to fill it up, make it full. Now the question then arises naturally, well, in what sense was the law not full? In what sense was it inadequate? What was it that had to be added or brought to the law? And in, in truth, this is what Jesus is talking about through, through most of the Sermon on the Mount when we begin to understand it. He says, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot, not one tittle, shall pass from the law till everything has come to pass. Whoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever shall do and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I'm telling you, unless your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. So here we've got a couple of standards. One, we have the standard of the scribes and the Pharisees, which apparently is not full. And Jesus said, your, your, your service to God, your righteousness, has got to be fuller, be more full, to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, or you're not even going to be in the kingdom of heaven. Now what on earth can that mean? And how on earth can you tackle it? Well, Jesus immediately launches into a very typical, actually, rabbinical, you know, certain type sermon of explaining the law. Everything he's doing from here forth is the teaching of the law. He said, you have heard that it has been said by them of old time, you shall not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. I can do that. I mean, I can't avoid killing somebody. I have gotten all the way to age 68 years old, and I have not killed anyone yet. I am blameless in this law. And in fact, I'm not going to embarrass anybody by a show of hands, but I dare say we don't have anybody here who probably would feel guilty of this law. Okay? So we all can do this, right? But perhaps this law isn't full. He goes on to say, I say unto you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, my hand comes down. I don't know about yours at that point. I, I, I feel at this point I have failed. Haven't killed anybody. But when you go on to this, I, I haven't reached this. He says, and whoever shall say to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council. Whoever say, shall say, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. And I know I've done that. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go your way. Be reconciled to your brother, then come offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way, lest at any time he deliver you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer, and you be cast into prison. I'm going to tell you, you're not coming out of there until you pay the last farthing. Now something very important has happened here. Jesus has 
poured something into this cup of law that we have that was not there before. Oh, it was there before, but it wasn't realized. It wasn't grasped. It wasn't written down in so many words. And because it wasn't written down, everybody would assume that they were doing just fine. Because the written law doesn't contain all of this sort of thing that we're not allowed to do. I think you'll find probably some indications in the written law that certain aspects of this cannot be done. But at the same time, the written law does not in a comprehensive way explain every nuance of what might involve the breaking of the law, does it? And so consequently, you can go through life blameless in that I've never killed anyone, and yet at the same time, not be living the sinless life. You have heard, it was said by them of old time, you shall not commit adultery. Now I'm sure not going to hold, but ask for a show of hands on this one. But at the same time, an awful lot of people can make it through their life and never commit adultery per se. And they could say, I've never done that. I've never slept with another man's wife. I have never made that mistake in all my time. I am a righteous person. I have lived a sinless life. But Jesus says, now wait, hold on. I say unto you, whosoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. I don't think there's any point in asking for show of hands on this one. Now, you see what I mean? Jesus is pointing out to us that there is a level of law, the written law, that a man certainly can live by, can live up to. That there's nothing in the written law that you can't do. There's nothing there that's laid out before you that you can't achieve. If you, on that particular occasion, on that particular day, decide, I am going to obey that law, you can do it. It's within your grasp. But when it comes down to the question of the more serious matters of the heart and mind, it becomes a little more difficult and much more problematic. Jesus goes on to say, if your right eye offend you, pluck it out. Throw it away. It's profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not that your whole body should be cast into hell. Now, let me just pause here for a moment. If you ever need to explain to somebody or demonstrate for somebody that Jesus speaks in figures of speech and he's not always to be taken literally, this is a good scripture for it right here because it's plainly a figure of speech. Now, I have known, I have known of two separate occasions, really, in, in entire years gone by where someone has taken it literally and actually cut a hand off because he thought he had to do it. The poor tormented soul had gone so far down a certain part of his life that he just he'd cut off his hand. And the story, I, one of them I, I heard about you know, through the church grapevine, the other one I heard about and read in the newspaper somewhere the guy had actually cut his hand off because of religious reasons. But Jesus is not, you know, I mean, it would have thought that any fool would be able to figure out that if you stole something it really isn't your hand's fault. Because the theft takes place in here. It takes place in your heart and in your mind. It's not just your hand. We can cut off your head, we can solve the problem, but that's not what Jesus is, doesn't work for the analogy that Jesus has got here. He goes on then to say, it has been said, whoever will put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Well, if someone once said, if you think marriage is hard, why do you try a divorce? But nevertheless, this law is within our grasp. And it's in the law. It's written down. Writing, giving, writing of divorcements in, Matthew, in Deuteronomy 24. I won't even turn there. It says, give her a writing of divorcement. So you can divorce your wife and live up to this law. But Jesus said, whoever shall put away his wife except for the cause of sexual impurity causes her to commit adultery, and whoever shall marry her that is divorced commits adultery. Now the point as we develop it through here is we have a law, a written law, that can be obeyed. But then as we go along, Jesus begins not so much to raise the bar higher, but to tell us how high the bar really is that we must reach. And this is where the difficulty begins to come into the picture. And this may be the, somewhat the explanation to why it was that the Apostle Paul could say, I live by the law blameless. And then later say that Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Because something had happened in Paul's life, in Paul's understanding, subsequent to that period of time. Again, you have heard it said by them of old time, you shall not forswear yourself, but shall perform to the Lord your oaths. Jesus said, I say to you, don't swear at all. Don't swear by heaven, that's God's throne. It's not yours to swear by. Don't swear by the earth, that's God's footstool. It's not yours to swear by. Neither by Jerusalem, that's the city of the great king. Don't swear by your head. 
you can't make one hair black or white. Well, some people think they can make a white hair black, but uh, you know, sooner or later the roots will come up. You show you can't do it. Just go ahead. See if you can do it. Any of you sitting here, see if you can change the color of your hair. Okay? Let your communication be yes, yes, no, no. You go beyond that, you've done something that's come of evil. Now, it isn't that Jesus, and the reason why Jesus starts off this lengthy discussion here by saying, I don't want you to think that I am come to destroy the law. Because you can easily see, can't you, as he goes along in here, how somebody's going to say, huh, this man's dismissing Moses. This man is destroying the law. Jesus says, no, no, no. I've not come to destroy. I've come to fill it up. I want you to fully understand what the law is all about. Not one jot, not one tittle. And by using that particular combination of words, he makes it clear to his listeners. His listeners knew immediately what he meant. He was referring to the written law, not necessarily to the traditions of the scribes, which in later times came to be called the oral law. Right? So he's trying to help them to understand. And so as he goes, makes his way through this, he makes you realize that, yeah, you've got the written law. And yes, you can live blameless by this written law. The problem is, there is a higher standard than that that is going to affect your life. And when we go back to all those benefits that I read to you earlier about the benefits of living the sinless life, you don't achieve those benefits merely by living up to the written law. Not that alone. You have got to go beyond that before those benefits will ever come your way. You heard it's been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I say to you, resist not evil, but whoever shall smite you on the right cheek, turn to him the other one also. If a man sues you at the law and takes away your coat, give him your cloak. Whoever shall compel you to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him that asks of you, and from him that would borrow of you, turn not away. Wow. Now all this stuff has been discussed ad infinitum elsewhere as far as the implications of all that Jesus said. I'm not going to go into all that today. All I want to say is that in the course of telling us this, he is telling us basically, don't be so defensive of yourself, your prerogatives, of your own you know, desires, your vengeance, your property, your time, all of these things. He is talking about opening up, both in, you know, to other people in your normal day of life, to authorities, if it's an authority that's compelling you to go a mile on some mail route, as they, some of us suggested this is about. Uh, in all of these things, Jesus is basically telling you, open up. Don't be so defensive. Don't be so self-protective. Don't be seeking your own way. And I'll tell you, this is where one of the really big crossings is in the question of obedience to the law of God in the spirit. It is, you know, because you can keep the letter of the law completely selfishly, it would seem, in many cases. You can't keep what Jesus is saying selfishly. You've got to open up. You've heard that it's been said, you may love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends his reign on the just and the unjust. Now Jesus said a lot of hard things in his ministry. And I would have to rank this one up there among the hard things because we have so much trouble with this. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Now right here I think there's a truth buried that, that, that could easily get lost. For many of us, we think in, of love in terms of the way we feel about people. Whereas when he talks about it here, he, he's talking about actions, not necessarily feelings. Because you can't really control your feelings. You can't you know, necessarily control whether or not you have a feeling, a warm, fuzzy feeling, towards somebody who has a declared, avowed enemy of yours, can you? But you can do the loving thing, can't you? In other words, love is an, is an outgoing thing. Love is action. Love is active. And you can actually treat your enemy as though you loved him. And this is what Jesus is actually calling on us to do. Because I don't believe for a moment that, that he expects us to feel something whenever someone has, 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 has stomped all over us. To not feel any resentment or not feel any antagonism. But what he does expect of us is that we do good to them. He says, do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. 
Now why should you do this? So you can be the children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise upon the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now it would really call forth a lot, wouldn't it, to ask us to treat our enemy precisely the same way we treat our best friend in terms of the pouring out of a benefit. And yet he says God doesn't make, he doesn't make it rain down property lines. When it rains, it rains, everybody gets the rain. If it gets, we have a drought, everybody goes without. And so it is. God does it that way. He says, if you're going to be his children, you've got to do the same thing. Now, is this hard? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you love them that love you, what reward have you? The publicans do that. If you salute your brothers only, what, what good are you doing there? Be you therefore perfect, as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. And you know, it's right here that most of us fall in the dust and, you know, we're, we, the, the, everything comes apart. Because the idea of actually being perfect as God is perfect really reaches beyond what we can get to. Now, is the picture beginning to open up to you just a little bit? You can be blameless in the literal sense of the law and guilty as sin when it comes to the intent of the law. Now, this was a little, I think, probably a little slow in coming to Paul. But by the time he wrote his letter to the Romans, the idea had gelled pretty firmly in his mind, and he saw things in a way that he had not seen them in years gone by. In the seventh chapter, he starts off by talking about how a man and a woman are married. He says, Brethren, I speak to them that know the law. Do you know how the law has dominion over a man as long as he's alive? For a woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. Romans 7, verse 2. But if the husband's dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So if while her husband lives, she is married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. If her husband is dead, she is free from the law. She is no adulteress, though she is married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, and this is the point of all the business about divorce and death, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit to God. Now, getting sinless is part of the challenge. And basically what he is saying this is, you have to become dead as far as the law is concerned. How is that done? Well, earlier in the book of Romans, he tells us it's by baptism, that we are buried with Jesus in baptism, thereby his death becoming our death as well. And as far as the law, which comes around with a war death warrant for us and says, where is he? I want him. He's mine. I want to take him out and hang him. The law said, I mean, the, 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 the faith says, he's dead. He's dead, buried, right over there with Christ. You can't have him. And so the law is satisfied. The death warrant is filled. You don't have to die. You're now free to begin to walk as a new creature in Christ. He says, when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. The motions of sins which were by the law. Now you'd almost get the feeling in reading this, and it would be a, but it would be a careless feeling if you got it, that it was the law that created sin. That somehow or other there wouldn't have been sin there if it hadn't have been for the law. He says, but now, he says, we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So Paul immediately draws a distinction. We're dead to the old law. Now we serve. We serve in the spirit of the law with a higher bar, with all that Jesus has laid out for us as far as our requirements are concerned, and the expectation of conduct. Now what are we supposed to say then? Is the law sin? Oh, God forbid. I would not have known sin but by the law, for I would not have known lust except the law had said, you shall not covet. He said, I wouldn't have understood this. I would have gone through life never knowing that, all, that my covetousness was somehow robbing me. Now we talk about the living the sinless life and all the benefits that come our way from living the sinless life. The problem is many people go through life with no idea of sin or lack of sin and they slowly and systematically destroy their lives by the way they live them. He says, I wouldn't have known this unless the law came along and said, thou shalt not covet. Now I know something I did not know before. Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. I don't think he means by this that 
that sin had no effect on us until the law came. I think that what he means is that we were not aware of it. Without the law, as far as our consciousness is concerned, sin was, not, was dead. I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, the commandment holy, and just, and good. But what happened? What went wrong? How did Paul come to realize that even though he had lived according to the commandment blameless through his life, that suddenly he realizes something is wrong here? He says, was then that which is good made death to me? No, God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. The best way I can explain this to you is to imagine yourself in an absolute, totally dark room. Can't see a thing. You know how it is. You know, you always run your fingers back and forth to see if there's any distinction at all when the hand goes by from anything else and you can't see a thing. And in this room, there are many obstacles, some hanging from the ceiling, some coming up from the floor, some sticking out from the wall. And as you wander around in the dark, you keep running into things. What Paul is trying to tell us is that the law turns on the light so that suddenly you can see where the obstacles, where the things to hit your head on, where the things to trip over and fall down are, that suddenly sin became apparent to him. All the things that the harm, the things that could hurt, the things that would hurt other people and the things that would hurt him, now became he became aware of them. That sin might appear to be sin, that's what the law accomplishes. For we know that the law is spiritual. I'm carnal, Paul said, sold under sin. For what I, what I, that which I, I do, I allow not. What I would, I don't do. What I hate, I do. If now I do it, I consent to the law that the law is good. And it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. To will is present with me. To perform that which is good, I find not. And you know, we have two or three things we have to worry with on this. One of them is, of course, human nature. And whenever God says don't do this, there's something in human beings that says makes them want to do it. And you sometimes will see it in children. Uh, just It starts off very early in life. And so we go through all these things and we struggle with them. And Paul says, the evil that I wish I would do, I don't do. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, it's no more I, but sin that dwells in me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, I can be delivered. Paul's style is very elliptical. He allows his readers to fill in the words which they know should be there. So then with the mind, I serve the law of God. With the flesh, the law of sin. And I think what Paul reveals to us in this rather awkwardly worded chapter is they lived a lot of his life not knowing. And all of a sudden, the law came. The light gets turned on. And the funny thing about this is that for Paul, there were two levels of it. He goes back all the way to the original commandment, thou shalt not covet. That opened up a, a, an avenue of things for him to live by. But then along comes Christ, and who raises the bar, or as I said, he doesn't really raise it. He simply reveals that that bar is much higher than Paul had ever imagined it to be. Paul could speak of himself as blameless only because he had been in the dark and didn't know it. You know, I think the same thing is true of Zacharias and Elizabeth. It's inconceivable that these two people never sinned. Inconceivable. And yet, they were blameless in one sense. They had managed to live by the commandments of the law, their lives blameless. People, I think people look at the law of God like a running a track with high hurdles, like a steeplechase where you have to jump over hedges and jump over water hazards and, and, and dodge around obstacles as you run. They look upon life, as a, I mean, upon the law as a steeplechase that is too hard for anyone to negotiate. That no one could ever keep the law perfectly. That God made, made it this way so that it would be difficult for us. I consider this to be a totally false impression. A better image is that life 
is like a track with high hurdles, a steeplechase that men are trying to run in the dark without seeing the obstacles, without knowing what's in the way and knowing where they go. The, the law of God would be better compared to stadium lighting. You know, they turn on the lights so we can see where the obstacles and the water puddles are and the different things that we have to make through. The problem is not the law. The problem is life. Someone once asked me, why is the law of God so complicated? My answer, because life is complicated. And our life today is a lot more complicated than it would be if we had lived the sinless life. Because sin creates new obstacles, creates new problems. One law broken means that there's another one to face further down the road that will be more difficult than the one you just passed. But it's not just that God creates laws for the sake of creating laws. It's that God gives us the law as a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. The scripture says, Great peace have all they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And earlier in this, 100, this 119th Psalm, verse 105, and if you haven't got this marked in your Bible, you really should, and you should memorize it. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light to my path. And it's something that I really feel that as time goes by, needs to become more ingrained in us. The understanding of the law of God not so much as shackles and chains, not as, as obstacles, not as things to make life hard or difficult, but as light. Light that once, you know, and, and when the, we come to the New Covenant in Hebrews 8, it says, I will write my law in your inward parts, and in your heart will I write it, so that we always have the light with us. My question is, what do we do to keep the lights on? If you want to live the sinless life, you're going to have to keep the lights on. How do you keep the lights on? Well, this is it. Thy word is a light to my feet and a lamp to my path. I don't know of any way of approaching this subject without systematically, deliberately, energetically, determinedly internalizing the law and the word of God. This is a long, involved Bible study, I mean, a sermon today, to make the point that you should study your Bible. If you want to live the sinless life, you are going to have to have the discipline of Bible study. And you're going to have to spend time in thinking about this. You're going to have to do some memorization along the way. I've told you before, I will tell you again, and I'll tell you again in the future, that the more you learn of the Word of God, the more you understand the Scriptures, the more often you're going to find yourself in life facing a difficult choice. And the scripture comes to mind. More often in life you're going to find yourself almost ready to do something that would be a very serious mistake. And the scripture comes to mind. So many times, and I'll never forget the one in my life, where I had really put my foot into something really big time. And I was about to open my mouth and try to explain away what I did. And the proverb came to mind. If you have spoken foolishly in lifting up yourself, lay your hand on your mouth. And I sat in my little office and clapped my hand literally across my mouth and said, I think it's time I shut up. One little example, and we could be here the rest of the day if I could remember all of the examples that in my life where the law of God, the word of God, a proverb, a psalm, uh, the words of Jesus have saved me from doing something really stupid or have helped me find my way out of the dark and back out into the light. Study your Bible every day of your life. Lie in your bed at night contemplating the Bible, thinking about the law of God. Argue with God if you'd like about why he makes this demand of you. Tell him you don't think it's necessary that you do this anymore if you don't think so. Talk it over with God. But the fact is that all the time you're talking, you're engraving deeper and deeper into your consciousness what God said about life, about the issues about of life, and the things that you're going to have to do. To live the sinless life is a goal that all of us ought to reach for so we can be perfect as our Father who is in heaven is perfect.